There have been numerous 13 cubed episodes covering Windows Memory Forensics. In fact, there's an entire Introduction to Memory Forensics playlist with numerous videos in which we analyze Windows memory captures with volatility to extract useful data. But what about Linux memory forensics? Well, that's an area we've left unexplored until now. Let's talk about how to capture memory from a modern Linux box. But first, taking a step back, in the old days, we'd use something like DD and point to a virtual device such as DevMem or DevKMem. The problem is modern Linux systems restrict access to these virtual devices and only allow access to a subset of memory, if the devices are even present at all. The current method is to use Linux Memory Extractor, or LIME, which is a loadable kernel module, or LKM. But what if there was an easier way? A way that didn't require knowledge of the target distro or kernel, or on-target compilation. In other words, a less noisy way. Well, that's where Microsoft AVML comes in. It stands for Acquire Volatile Memory for Linux. Wait a minute, you mean Microsoft made a tool for Linux memory acquisition? Yep, they sure did. It was written in Rust. It's intended to be deployed as a static binary, which means you just download it and run it with no on-target compilation necessary, which is a big deal. It will output in the LIME format that we just mentioned when not using the optional compression. And it acquires memory from dev crash, proc kcore, or dev mem. If you don't specify the memory source on the command line, AVML will iterate over the available memory sources to find a functional one. It's been tested on a wide range of distros and luckily it just works, except when it doesn't. So let's take a look at a demo. We're going to hop over to an Ubuntu 18.04 virtual machine and do the following things. We'll download and run AVML to capture memory. We'll then download volatility. We'll build a custom volatility profile specific to our kernel version. This is a key required step if you want to use volatility to analyze a Linux memory capture. We'll then point volatility at the AVML memory dump and specify our newly created profile and profit. That's it. Now, obviously in the real world, we would not analyze the memory on the same machine from which it was acquired. This is a demo, but let's jump in and take a look at how this works. All right, as you can see, we're looking at the Microsoft AVML GitHub repo. And if we take a quick look around, we'll notice a list of features, some information about how to use the tool. By the way, you can even use AVML to upload to AWS or Azure. There's information about how to build it, how to contribute to the project, various things like that. But really, we don't need to worry about any of that. All we need to do is go over to the releases section and you will notice that we have AVML, AVML Convert, and AVML Minimal. We're just going to grab AVML. So I'll simply click this and we'll save the file onto the desktop, which you can see is already selected. So I'll click Save, and now let's switch over to the terminal, and there's the file. If I run File Against It, you will notice it is an ELF 64-bit executable. And let's go ahead and change the permissions so that we can execute it. And now if we run it without any arguments, you can see the basic usage. But let's try it again with dash dash help so we can see the full help. As you can see, we have the option to compress the image, which we're not going to do. And we also have some options that allow us to upload this or specify block sizes, various things like that. But really, this is all we're interested in. Just the name of the file to write on the local system. Yeah, it really is that easy. We simply run AVML and then output the name of the file we want it to create. Now, here's the problem. Watch this. Uh-oh. Anyone know what I did wrong? Yep, you have to be root, much like you have to have local admin privileges on a Windows box to capture memory. So I've sped this up, obviously, but it doesn't end up taking too long. It's going to vary greatly depending on how much RAM is in your system. But this virtual machine happens to have eight gigs of RAM. So I expect an eight gig capture. And as you can see, the memory dump here is indeed eight gigs. That's it. That is literally how to run the tool. We gave it one argument, which was the name of the file we wanted it to output. 
and we have now a lime output memory dump. All right, so now what? Well, now let's move over to volatility, which is not currently on this machine. You're looking at all of the repos available, but really we just want the volatility repo right here. We're not going to be using the public beta for three, but just the production version of two. So let's grab that and we'll simply do a git clone to pull down the repo. And this is going to be version 2.6.1, which is again, the newest as of the recording of this episode, even though volatility three is out in public beta. Check out the 13 cubed episode covering that if you want to learn more. So we've done that and you can notice the volatility directory is there. If we change into it and take a quick look around, we'll notice the standard files and directories that are always part of the volatility package. No big deal. Okay, so here are the steps that we need to follow. We need to change into the tools Linux directory. And you'll notice a make file here, which might be a hint that we need to compile something, right? Well, we do indeed need to compile something here. And to do that, we're simply going to run make. Now, unfortunately, there's an error. You'll notice it did fail, and it's saying that a particular binary called dwarf dump was not found. That is a necessary package that needs to be installed. So fortunately, that's quite easy to do. Just sudo apt install dwarf dump. And once we install it, we can try the make again, and hopefully it will build successfully because this is what's going to be necessary for us to make the volatility profile specific to this kernel version. And you can see it appeared to work without any issues. Now let's go back to our desktop. So back in the directory in which we started. And if we take a look around, we have, of course, the two files and the one volatility directory. The next step is to create the zip archive of the volatility profile. If you take a look at the kernel version, we're running 5.3.0-46. So I'm going to create a zip file called Ubuntu underscore and then that specific kernel version. This is not mandatory, but it certainly does help when you have multiple profiles installed. So there is the name of my zip file, which matches the name of the kernel version. It is very important that we make a version, a profile specific to this kernel. So now we're going to include two things. We're going to include the newly compiled module.dwarf file that we just made and the debug symbols found in the system.map file of the currently running kernel. That's it. But you'll notice that we get a permission denied message here. Well, that's because I can't read that boot system map file without being root. No big deal. We'll just simply use the up arrow and run sudo in front of it. And there we go. So at this point, we have created our nice little zip file, which is the profile that we can feed into volatility to analyze the memory image. So obviously we need to place this somewhere so volatility will see it. What we're going to do is move it into volatility. And then there is a specific directory underneath that called volatility, plugins, overlays, Linux. That's it. We're going to put that zip file in that location. At this point, if we change into volatility and we run volatility with the dash dash info flag and then pipe that through more, we should see that newly installed profile at the very top of our list. And there it is. It even says a profile for Linux Ubuntu, and then it has the specific kernel version. So there is our newly created profile and volatility does indeed see it. So at this point, it's a piece of cake. We simply run python vol.py, we point to our memory dump, we specify the profile, which I've copied to the clipboard so I don't have to type it in. And now instead of something like PS list, we're going to use Linux underscore PS list. Yes, they are prefaced or prepended, I guess, with Linux underscore. So I went ahead and made that a little smaller so it'll fit on the screen. And as you can see, we have a PS list output similar to what you're used to when analyzing Windows memory captures. And I'm quickly just paging down through here to show you that the data is indeed valid. In fact, let's go ahead and grep for Firefox because as you noticed, the Firefox browser was running at the point that we captured the memory and it should be here. And yep, there it is. So you can see the PID, the PPID, 
and the various information regarding that. So let's take a look at PS Tree, which is another one of my favorite go-to volatility plugins. And you'll notice it works very similar to the Windows version with the periods used to show the parent-child relationships. So very easy to use. Let's think about some other plugins. How about Linux underscore Netstat? That is certainly a very important plugin that we often use on Windows. And paging down through here, there's not a whole lot of network related activity, but you will see a couple of IP addresses and some listening processes and whatnot, but that's all there is to using Netstat. Let's take a look at LSOF, which will list the open files. And you can expect there'll be a lot of output here. This is literally a point in time, kind of like running LSOF on the system at the point at which the memory capture was taken. And you'll notice a lot of output here. Very cool. And one other one to show you. How about bash? That's right. Things actually typed in to the bash prompt. Bash history, if you will, right out of memory. So after a few seconds, we'll actually be able to parse that directly from this memory image. And as you can see, you'll notice some commands I've typed in here from previous 13 cubed episodes. Uh, you can even see USB rip here, which is an episode that I made a while back covering another Linux forensics tool. So it's just that easy. All the plugins were named the same as you would expect from Windows land, except they were prepended with the Linux underscore. And once we had that profile built, we simply ran volatility just like we normally would and pointed it at the image, specifying that profile and then our plugin. So let's recap. We have used Microsoft AVML to acquire a memory capture from a Linux box. We have then built a custom volatility profile specific to the exact kernel version in use on the system. And then we have simply used volatility as we always have specifying the profile and our plugin. And that is it. That's how easy it is to at least get started with Linux memory forensics. Now, depending on how useful you find this episode, I've got some plans to create plenty of other follow-up Linux memory forensics episodes in which we analyze Linux related malware or even some pretend malware just to answer some questions with volatility and get some practice. So let me know in the comments down below if you find this useful. As always though, thank you for watching, thank you for subscribing, and I will catch you in the next episode.